So let's take a look at Unit 8, which is Cardiovascular System, and we're going to start with the heart. Um, so we've got the apex of the heart down here, where it kind of comes to a point, and it's mainly formed by the left ventricle, which is this that you see there. And this is the anterior surface of the heart. We can also see the base of the heart, which is up here, formed by the right atrium and the left atrium. Another good view for base of the heart is back here. So apex was there, base across the back. All of this in tan is part of the left atrium. And the right atrium is the light blue color here. The diaphragmatic surface is what's going to touch the diaphragm. So if we look back here where this heart would sit against the diaphragm muscle, that's diaphragmatic surface. The sternocostal surface is mainly formed by the right ventricle and the right atrium. The left border of the heart is basically coming down this view, so it's going to include aortic arch, pulmonary trunk, part of the left atrium, and left ventricle. So this is our left border. Right border includes superior vena cava right atrium, and inferior vena cava here. Then we can move on to some surface markings for the heart. So the atrioventricular sulcus, or coronary sulcus, runs between the atria and the ventricles around the heart. So where you see this red and blue line coming, those fill the atrioventricular sulcus. We also have an anterior interventricular sulcus, so where these two red and blue lines run is on the anterior side of the heart between the right and left ventricles, so interventricular sulcus. And then on the posterior side of the heart, between right ventricle and left ventricle, posterior interventricular sulcus. So I'm going to try to follow your lab guide at this point for features of the heart. Starting on page 115, we're going to start by looking at the right atrium. So this light blue coloring here represents the right atrium. And we can flip this window open to see the chamber, the inside of the right atrium. So a couple features to notice. We see this little white circle labeled 36. That's the fossa ovalis which is the remnant of foramen ovale from fetal circulation. Then we're going to see just on the anterior side of the heart. So once we flip this window open, we're looking at pectinate muscle, these little brown spots in the blue. But as that closes, it's just on the anterior side of the atrium. Same thing for the left atrium. Pectinate muscle is just going to be on the anterior surface. The right auricle is this little ear-like projection that comes off of the right atrium. So each atrium has its own auricle or a little pouch that can expand to fill with more blood. And then back in there, number 34, which is a red circle, represents the ostium of the coronary sinus. So blood that's pumped to the heart muscle to provide it with, with nutrients drains back and it all comes back into this right atrium through this hole here, the ostium of the coronary sinus. The last two openings that we're going to see from this view are the superior vena cava, so blood coming from head and neck and upper limbs here, and then below the opening for inferior vena cava, which is draining everything from the liver and below. Where fossa ovalis is located, this surface is the interatrial septum between the two atria. And then as we move over to the other atrium, our, our left atrium, it's also got uh, the other half of the interatrial septum. So now we're taking a look at the right ventricle over here, inferior to the right atrium. As I flip that over, you can see these little markings all the way around the right ventricle. This is called trabeculae carnae, so it's the, the meat columns 
of the ventricles, and those are found in both ventricles. Don't confuse those with pectinate muscle, which are only found on the anterior surface of the atria. Okay, so trabeculae carnae in ventricles. There's also papillary muscles, which aren't shown real well on this model, but if I bring in another model, papillary muscles in the ventricle are going to attach to these cords, which are called chordae tendinae. So we'd say right there is a papillary muscle, and here's another one. They're really obvious when you get to see them in a real heart. But the papillary muscle pull on the chordae tendinae and prevent the, the atrioventricular valves from prolapsing back into the atria when pressure increases in the ventricles. So we get to see the chordae tendinae there. They're not shown on this model. The right atrioventricular valve goes between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It's also called the tricuspid valve. So it would be the hole that my finger is going through now. And then the pulmonary semilunar valve is this three-cusped valve, which is going to pump, as the, as the right ventricle contracts, it's going to force blood out the pulmonary semilunar valve and into the pulmonary trunk. As we move on over to the left ventricle, you can see we have that same kind of wall between the left and right ventricles that we did between left and right atria. So we'll call this wall the interventricular septum. Still got trabeculae carnae all the way around the ventricle. Where blood flows from the left atrium down into the left ventricle, it's going to go through the left atrioventricular valve or the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And then as the left ventricle contracts, it's going to force blood through this three cusp valve. This is the aortic semilunar valve. So that's going to push blood up into the ascending aorta and aortic arch. So now I want to take a look at some of the vessels coming from the heart and going back to the heart will be on page 116 of your lab guide. As soon as blood leaves that aortic semilunar valve, it's in the ascending aorta, which turns right above the heart. This is called the aortic arch. And then after that is the descending aorta. Right? And as long as it's above the diaphragm, it's thoracic aorta. The first two branches that come off the aorta are going to be the right and left coronary arteries. We'll come back to those later. Coming off the aortic arch, we see the brachiocephalic artery or brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. So left common carotid is going to work its way up the left side of the neck left subclavian on out underneath the clavicle to the upper limb where it'll become axillary and brachial artery later on. Brachiocephalic trunk for the right side has a small trunk and then it splits into these same two arteries for the right side. So we'd have a right common carotid and a right subclavian come off the brachiocephalic trunk. Also with our pulmonary vessels, so as blood gets pumped out of the, the right ventricle, it goes into the pulmonary trunk, where it then goes into one of two pulmonary arteries. So a left pulmonary artery or a right pulmonary artery goes to the lungs, becomes reoxygenated, and comes back through multiple pulmonary veins. So these red structures here are representing oxygenated blood that's coming back to this left atrium. And then if we look across the base of the heart, there's two others which are coming back from the right side but coming back to the left atrium as well. So those are more pulmonary veins. Also coming off the pulmonary trunk, we see ligamentum arteriosum, this little white piece, and this holds the pulmonary trunk to the aortic arch. It was functional in fetal circulation as the ductus arteriosus, allowing 
oxygenated blood to mix with deoxygenated blood since the lungs weren't functional yet. Finally, we're going to take a look at some of these vessels that come off. So I mentioned earlier, the first two arteries that come off the aorta are right and left coronary arteries. The left coronary artery ducts behind that pulmonary trunk. Part of it continues on down through the anterior interventricular septum, and we call that the anterior interventricular artery. A lot of the times it's referred to as the LAD, or left anterior descending. The rest of that is going to come around through the atrioventricular sulcus as the circumflex artery. And then our right coronary artery is going to come off, spin around. Part of it becomes the posterior interventricular artery, right here, which is descending the posterior interventricular sulcus. And almost always anastomosis or comes together with the anterior interventricular artery there. And then the only other artery we're going to ask you to know for this course off of right coronary is the right marginal artery. So this comes down the margin of the right ventricle here. The blood that came through those arteries is supplying the heart muscle with the oxygen and glucose and everything that it needs. That blood has to be drained back through a series of veins. So starting down here at the apex of the heart, the great cardiac vein is going to drain blood up and then all the way around through the atrioventricular sulcus to this coronary sinus, which is this big blue enlargement here, right before it heads into this right atrium. So again, all of this was great cardiac vein. Coming up that posterior interventricular sulcus is the middle cardiac vein, right here. On the left, so if I flip this back around to anterior view, on the left side, we've got a vein that comes up on the posterior wall of the left ventricle. So we'll call this posterior vein of the left ventricle, which drains into the great cardiac vein and then comes to the coronary sinus. And then the last vein to know is over here by the right marginal branch. This is the small cardiac vein which comes around to the coronary sinus. So small cardiac vein right there.